have great wonder and awe at the grand and miraculous deeds that God accomplishes. Um, and we are, those Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, tell some of those stories, or part of the story of uh, God dividing the Red Sea so that the Israelites could come through, and then when the Egyptians went through, they, the water came back and covered them up so that the Israelites could escape. We're used to thinking of God having great power like that. But I wonder if we also see God's willingness to forgive as a great power in line with that. Is it the same sort of miraculous power? Is it the same thing that only God can do? <coughs> forgive? You know, there's, what is, there's that uh, saying, to err is human, to forgive is divine, right? Oh, okay. Well, I guess that means, as human beings, we're pretty much limited to the erring part, <coughs> and um, the forgiving part, we don't get a chance to participate in since we're not divine. But I think that's, that's a dangerous way for us to think and feel. And Jesus, in his ministry, both in the words that he speaks and the actions that he takes, emphasizes the importance of forgiveness, not only that God forgives human beings, but that human beings need to forgive human beings. That we are called to imitate God in that way. God forgives us, and we need to forgive one another. And this forgiveness, while it can, it can be or relate to something that can be fairly small or, or not of great consequence, um, you know, someone, someone forgets to make a phone call uh, or someone forgets to return a book or something along those lines. And, and then they, they realize this, and so they call us up, and, and they say, I, I'm so sorry, I know I was supposed to call you at 8, and I forgot, will you please forgive me? And we say, well, yeah, of course, I'll forgive you. you know, so, and, and so we have those moments, and we think, ah, forgiveness, that's kind of what it entails. And while that's part of it, it's not the whole of it. And the forgiveness that Jesus is, is speaking about and, and asking us to engage in is more like the forgiveness that heals the wounds of our broken world. Now that's no small thing. What forgiveness does when we offer forgiveness to someone else, when someone else forgives us, is to allow for our relationship to continue. It allows for us to continue to have conversations with one another. It allows for us to both speak and to listen to someone who's hurt us or someone we have hurt. But without forgiveness being offered or received, those conversations tend to come to an end. It's not, it's not open dialogue, but rather a wall that's been placed in between. And so what hurt what is broken remains hurt and broken. In our third scripture passage this morning, Jesus is talking about forgiveness, and he's talking about the extending of forgiveness. And, um, and sometimes we will hear this passage and, and perhaps think, well, this just doesn't, it doesn't apply to us. But I think... The reality is that there's something very, very important being shared with us about how it is that we can forgive and how much it is that we can forgive and the importance of us engaging in forgiveness. So let us listen for the word of God as it's found in the gospel according to Matthew, reading from the 18th chapter, verses 21 through 30. Five. 
Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt, because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my God will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God bless this reading from Holy Scripture. So in this, in this story that Jesus tells, um, that I think part of the temptation might be to say that God equals the king. Um, and while there might be some parallels, I think we need to be careful of that. Rather, let's see if we can unpack what's going on here. Um, the king sits down, decides, all right, it's time for me to get all this money that's owed me. And he starts looking at the account, and he notices that one of his slaves owes him 10,000 denarii, not 10,000, 10,000 talents. So, you know, we hear that, 10,000 talents, that's a lot of money, right? Whew, boy, this guy owes a lot. What this slave owes the king is 150,000 years of labor. That's what a talent is, a, uh, basically what a slave or a person would be paid for an entire year. So if he owes 10,000 of that, 150, or, yeah, I, I figured that. I did the math. I did. <laughs> so it's 150,000 years worth of labor. That's what the slave owes the king. <clears throat> How's he going to pay that? How do you get that in debt? He knows that. The king knows that. So the king says, you know, you owe all this. You haven't, haven't made any attempt to pay it back. Um, I'm, just, I'm going to sell you. I'm going to sell your wife. I'm going to sell your kids. I'm going to sell all your possessions. And I'll get some of what is owed you back. Not the whole thing, but some of it. And, uh, and we're told that that slave falls down on his knees. He begs forgiveness. Please, please. I will I'll do what I can do. I'll do all I can do. I will pay you back. Please, don't do this. And the king looks at him and says, hmm, okay, all right, I, I forgive you. And in fact, not only am I going to forgive you, but I'm going to forgive all your debt. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about that 150,000 years worth of salaries you owe me. A tremendous act. Tremendous act of forgiveness. So we're told that slave leaves the king's presence, and as he's going on his way, he runs into another slave who owes him a hundred denarii, much smaller, much, much, much smaller amount. 
We're told he grabs the slave by the throat and says, you need to pay what you owe me. The slave falls on his knees, begs him, please forgive me. I will, uh, I will work and pay everything back to you. And, uh, and the first slave says, no, I'm throwing you in prison until you can pay me back. Which is one of those concepts that's truly bizarre, right? Of course, we still do it today. But if you owe something, you owe a debt, well, let's throw you in prison until you can pay the debt back. Which, but if you can't work, how are you going to pay the debt back? You can't really, which means you're just going to stay in prison. So that's what this slave does to the second slave. After he's been forgiven... He turns around and does nothing of the kind. And so we're told the other slaves hear about this and they're really upset. So they go to the king and they say, did you you hear what happened? And the king calls back that first slave. Oh, you wicked slave. I forgave you all this. Why wouldn't you forgive your fellow slave in like that? I'm throwing you in prison until you can pay me back. Which means he'll be in prison for the rest of his life. This is also an important part of the story. The king doesn't forget what happened, how much that first slave owed him. We, you know, when we talk about forgiveness, we tend to get it connected, conflagulated it with forgetting. And we're not told we've got to forget. What we're told we should do is forgive. Because forgetting sometimes is really dangerous. When people hurt us really badly, when people abuse us, we don't want to forget that. Because the danger is they could do that again. Or they could do that to somebody else. We can forgive that person. But we shouldn't forget. We might have to forgive that person a number of different times. But each and every time we forgive that person, we need to make sure that we're being very clear, this is unacceptable. And you will not do this to me, and you will not do this to other people. If you continue to do this, then... We're going to have to look at other ways that you're going to relate to me and other folks. God doesn't ask us to forget, but God does ask us to forgive. And God pays attention. The last part of this passage, God pays attention to when we forgive and when we don't. And when we don't forgive, it's one of the things that really ticks God off. Because we're told, Jesus told us, Jesus lived his life in such ways to remind us that God has forgiven us. Right? All the things that we've done that we shouldn't have done. All the opportunities we had to do something and we didn't do it. All the mean words we've said either to someone or behind someone's back with the intent of hurting someone. God forgives all that. And God says, and what I need you to do is to forgive in like manner. Now, why does God say that? Because it's a nice thing to do. Yeah. But there's more to it than that. We go back to the king and the slave in the first instant. So here's the king has this choice, right? He has this guy that owes him way more money than he's ever going to be able to pay him back. In his economic thinking, his business thinking, he says, well, you know what? I've got this huge debt. How am I going to recover at least some of this debt? Because I'm never going to get it all back. Well, I could sell him and his whole family and all his possessions, and I'll get a portion of that debt back. I could do that. Makes business sense, yes. But what does it mean to the community if I do that? What does it mean to the community of people that the slave is a part of? 
Well, it means that that slave is no longer in that community. And the work that he was doing has to be done by another slave at least up until the time in which the, the king can find a slave to replace the one who owed all that money. So he disrupts all this that is happening, the way that work is done within his community. He could also be disrupting the social fabric. You know, we don't know how this first slave fit in with the whole slave community. Apparently, part of what he did was loan money, but I guess he didn't get money back because he owed all this on him. We don't know. But what we know is that he is related to all these other slaves. So to take him out of that could be really problematic. The king recognizes that. And the king, in weighing this, says, I do not want to disrupt the community. I do not want to disrupt the community that much. Even though it means I'm going to lose out on a whole bunch of money, I don't want to do that. I'm going to forgive him. Uh, not only am I going to forgive him, I'm going to tell him, you don't owe me the debt. Maybe if I take that pressure off of him, he will, uh, he'll be able to act and react within his life a little better than he has in the past. That's what forgiveness does, right? When we forgive other people, we are allowing a community, we're allowing our families to function better in the best way, perhaps, that they were in, in the way that they were intended to, by offering forgiveness. We allow people to continue to function in the unit or in the community. We allow them to maybe have a little less pressure on them. We allow communication to continue to happen back and forth. Now, people have to ask for forgiveness in order for us to give it. And if they ask for forgiveness, then there's a good chance that they'll at least try to follow through and not repeat what they've done previously. But when it's asked for, we are called to offer. Now, in the second instance, the slave that's just been forgiven all this, he meets a fellow slave. He has the exact same opportunity. He has the opportunity not to disrupt his community. He has the opportunity not to disrupt the second slave's family. He has the opportunity to do all that, and yet he chooses not to. He chooses to put his needs, his desires before the good of the whole community. Now that's called greed, self-centeredness, whatever we want, and it's also caused, called not forgiving. That second slave did the same thing the first slave did, right? He fell on his knees. He asked for forgiveness. He said he would pay back the debt. And the, the, that first slave ignores him. <clears throat> now, I'm just going to punish you. Off to jail you go. And the king is upset. The king is mad. The king is God. God is mad. Because God sees. God recognizes. Here was another opportunity for a community to be mended. And instead, it was broken to a greater extent. Here was another opportunity for people to open lines of communication as opposed to closing them. And that first slave, even though he was forgiven, fails. And that's one of the things that really, really makes the king mad. And rightfully so. So as we contemplate forgiveness, asking for it, and asking for it, and receiving it, and offering it, while it is hard, while some might call it divine, something that only that God can do. We know better. Jesus has taught us, told us. Now, it's not just, this isn't just God's job. This is our job too. This is human being's job. It's not easy. Sometimes it's incredibly hard. 
Sometimes we can't do it at first. But we need to. We absolutely need to. Because it is in forgiving and being forgiven that the world, the broken world, is mended. And that is God's hope.